Welcome back to Comfort Zone. I'm your host, Chrissy Wilson, and today we are here with Peyton Stevie Lee, CLC journalist and representative of Ukrainian political issues regarding 2013 to 14's Euro Medan revolution. Thank you for being here, Miss Lee. Thank you for having me. So tell us, what was the Euro Medan revolution, and to what purpose did it serve in the Ukraine? The Euromedan revolution began on November 21st, 2013, but Ukrainian government corruption in which led to these events was taking place long before this demonstration. Really? Yes. Ever since Ukraine declared its independence from the Soviet Union in 1991, Ukrainian government stability and economic value among its surrounding countries has greatly decreased. In 1994, Leonid Danilovich Kuchma was elected president of Ukraine, bringing with him into office many greedy and, amb and ambitious politicians. Worst of the team was Pavlo Lazarenko. Who's he? The same year as Kuchma's elected presidency, Lazarenko was convicted by the U.S. District Court of fraud, conspiracy to launder money, money laundering, and transportation of stolen property. He was a criminal. Former Communist Party officials, now National Patriots, led the, the new state. The corruption had become widespread within the government. There must have been opposition. Of course there was. In 2000, Kuchma's former bodyguards leaked hundreds of hours of private transcripts of the president's phone conversations, which made it clear that the president had been sitting atop a vast criminal system. You see, under Ukraine's constitution, government officials were not elected. They were appointed by the president, allowing him full control of office, filling it with oligarchs, his choice of rich men with a strong political influence. These groups became dominant in the nation, establishing each of their own political parties. They owned and controlled their own national broadcast media, local and national newspa newspapers, each capable of heavily funding Kuchma's political campaigns in the emerging pseudo-democratic system. Well, something must have changed this. Uh, Kuchma eventually lost his presidency, did he not? Yeah. By 2001, Kuchma's power began to weaken, and his criminality started coming to light. Finally, he faced an, op an opposition campaign, impeaching him for his role in an abduction ending in the murder of investigative journalist Hiri Gondazgi. <coughs> the campaign stalled as Kuchma deliberately avoided the legal procedure needed to formally make the charges. This is when Viktor Yashchenko stepped in. His new approach as Ukrainian Prime Minister assisted in Ukraine's economic turnaround. Despite Kuchma's opposing views and forceful removal of Yushchenko as Prime Minister, Yushchenko had clearly become Ukraine's most popular politician, by far. With the end of Kuchma's term approaching, who is the opposing presidential up-and-comer? Viktor Yanukovych. With Rus Russia's support, he gained much popularity. As the 2004 elections grew near, the government elite grew nervous. Though television coverage and bill dub doubling on retiree pensions sparked support for Yanukovych, his criminal record and association with Kuchma's regime raised much doubt and suspicion. Yanukovych had previously spent three and a half years in jail for assault and robber robbery. Unbelievable. And then who won the election? Well, that's the question, isn't it? On the morning of the vote, hundreds and thousands of Yushchenko supporters filled Independent Square, Kiev, awaiting the results of the election. During this event, independent domestic mon monitors sounded the alarm about the possible emerging fraud. As, follow as following the closing of polling stations, the tally of votes in support of Yanukovych magically increased from a losing comparison to a winning result. His plan to steal this election began long before the election date itself. For six months, government-controlled national television subject subjected Yushchenko to consistent negative press and distortion, all while refusing him an opportunity to defend himself. Isn't that the point of an election, to deter supporters from the opposing side using whatever means necessary? Well, yes, but to a legal extent, though. For example, Yushchenko's campaign itself faced suspicious impediments as well. Flights were denied landing privileges minutes before ra major rallies. Road barriers were set in order to slow his travels. One day, a truck attempted to drive Yushchenko off the road. Private security detail discovered that Yushchenko was being followed by a state security operative. This man was caught with false identity papers, multiple license plates, and video and audio recording equipment. Yushchenko's campaign activists were harassed as well, some arrested under false charge. Students living in, in university housing were threatened to support y Yanukovych, or they would be evicted midwinter from their dorms. All of these interruptions controlled by the government corrupt officials. Monitors had even discovered that pens had been filled with disappearing ink, so ballots would appear blank after votes had already been cast. According to the Nonpartisan Committee of Voters in Ukraine, approximately 85,000 government officials assisted in perpetrating the fraud, and at least 2.8 million ballots were rigged in favor of Yanukovych. After a mysterious illness that forced him from his campaign for nearly a month, tests revealed, tests revealed that Yushchenko had been suffering from dioxin poisoning. 
How did Yushchenko respond to all of this? Well, with the well documented with the well documented criminal fraud in the aftermath of the election runoff, Yushchenko devised a two track strategy: one revolutionary and the other constitutional, dedicated to appealing their efforts to Parliament and the Supreme Court. Engaging in his revolutionary strategy, Yushchenko declares himself presidency and takes the oath of office on November 22, 2004, the first day of the Orange Revolution, the civil movement that inspired the Euromedan Revolution in 2014. As President Yushchenko calls for a nationwide general strike, urging the militia and the military to stand with the people and calling on local governments to transfer their allegiance to his own council, protesters waited nervously, wondering, would the authorities, res would the authorities respond with force? And then did they? No, thankfully. Even though Yanukovych demanded physical force should be taken in order, to in order to control and disperse the crowd, authorities dared not intervene with the military, and the Security Bureau of Ukraine divided. SBU leaders made their willingness to use force to defend and protect the protesters known. The relationship between Yushchenko and segments of the SBU was the crucial element responsible for preserving the peace during this demonstration. On November 27th, following days of, a mass pro of mass protests leading to the siege of the cabinet of ministers, the presidential administration, and Kuchma's own residency, parliament met and majority voted to declare the poll invalid. Six days later, Ukraine's su Ukraine Supreme Court concluded the runoff results as irrelevant and accepted Yushchenko's legal evidence of massive fraud and high-level conspiracy. The court called for fresh elections. On the morning of December 27th, six hours after the polls closed, Yushchenko addressed the nation. We are free. The old era is over. We are a new country now. How long did this new freedom last? It never began. Illegal po political Im intimidation never came to an end. High-ranking officials suspected of participating in the fraud have yet to be prosecuted, and state television is still a wasteland of propagandistic pro programming. Not only this, but following the end of Yushchenko's presidential term, the corruption inspired by Yanukovych once again took control of internal government, and in 2010, Yanukovych was re-elected president of Ukraine. Though it was promised that Viktor Yanukovych signs the e European uh, Union Agreement, Viktor instead signs a secret treaty with the West, joining Russia. Russia's economic union. This initi initiates the Euro Euromedan Revolution and the documentary of the events called Winter on Fire, Ukraine's Fight for Freedom, directed by Evgeny Efanevsky. Uh, how does Winter on Fire begin? At what state are the people in? Outraged. A post on social media goes viral amongst the students of the nation, inviting everyone to Mi Medan, Independent Square, the same place the Orange Revolution took place. Many people arrived to organize a peaceful protest demanding the signing of the EU agreement. Within half an hour, thousands of people had arrived. The weather was terrible, the people stood in the cold and in the rain, but no one faltered in their pride. No one left. The Euromedan revolution had begun. It was a peaceful demonstration the, na the nation referred to as feeling like a joyous celebration, peaceful and patriotic, everyone united for our future and our freedom. Um, Miss Lee, so what changed the nature of their protest? On the ninth day of the protests, the results are announced regarding the EU signing. Yanukovych lied again. He did not sign the agreement. The protesters chant, shame, shame, and revolution in anger and disbelief, in which Yanukovych responds to the only way he knows, with violence. He orders Ukrainian police and government-assigned soldiers called the Berkut to Medan Square to silence the protesters. Police were armed with iron batons. Innocent protesters are beaten to the ground, beaten to silence, and beaten to death. A girl as young as 18 is seen beaten. Many of the protesters were students. Majority of the first 300 to 400 people to, to, to arrive at Medan Square that day were students. Protesters retreat, retreat to the Mikhailivsky Zolotarivsky Monastery. <laughs> I was absolutely horrified at how quickly the civilians were attacked. On day 10, November 30th, 2013, you report that the monastery was at capacity dealing with the wounded, head traumas, confusion, and shock. I understand that it was the civilians that formed medical stations and other support stations for food, warm clothes, and information. Now, once again, how did the re officials respond to this? Well, a busload of police officers in Bakut are, Bakut are assigned and sent to the monastery gates in attempts to intimidate the crowd, but the protesters stand their ground, standing opposite the officers, screaming desperate questions. Why? Why are you doing this? How can you do this to your brothers and sisters? Why? The intimidation fails, and the officers are called to retreat to plan their next move. Two days later, the protesters staying at the monastery collectively decided that they are going to stay in Medan and continue their peaceful protest. For protection from police and officers, police officers and Berkut, they built 
They build barricades out of whatever city materials they can find. Park benches, wood, and barbed wire. Once again, the protesters are attacked, and once again, people are beaten and injured. Some are killed. Military veterans in the area grow concerned about the students and protesters, so they join the demonstration as well. With all this chaos, <coughs> what was the next step for the people? And could you give us a visualization of what was happening in the streets? At this point, the number of protesters had grown higher than one million. After reserves deny any assistance, the protesters arrange for what is known today as the March of Millions. On December 8, 2013, day 18 of the Euromedan Revolution, people of all different walks of life from all over Ukraine united for one mission. The common man, people of different religions, priests and holy men, renowned members of society, even women and children took part. As the march begins, women, men, women, and children head towards the Verkhanova Rada Parliament buildings to raise their voice. But of course, police had built their own barriers to, to halt the march. As the protesters approach the barrier, government-planted provocateurs instigate violence toward the officers, organized to recreate an illusion of self-defense, as though the police had reason to take action. They tear gas and throw stun grenades into the crowd of innocents, beating anyone they manage to grab. The protesters respond, driving a bulldozer through the police barriers. As the males maintain the front line, the women are sent to the stage for safety. An elderly man is horribly beaten and chaos ensues among the protesters, defending themselves with whatever they can find on the ground. Rocks, sticks, wood for shields, wood for shields, whatever. The people had lost all fear of being hurt. At 1.30 a.m. on December 11th, protesters gather again in Maidan Independent Square, ready to take their last stand. For the first time in 800 years, Kiev's Golden Dome Monastery bell rang out in support of the protesters, in support of the nation. At this point, <clears throat> what was it that kept the people motivated? Were, were they gaining ground? And if so, how? I believe the people kept motivated because at this point in their protest, they felt they had no other choice but to fight. Watching so many of their own people die for this revolution only solidified this feeling. These people will not have died for nothing. As for gaining ground, indeed they were. A retired army sergeant organized fellow military men to support and teach defense mechanism to the protesters. His actions helped create the Maidan Defense Unit. These men secured the perimeter and assisted in building new, more efficient barriers. These men supplied medication and food, and volunteers began arriving from all over the country. Car companies released all vehicles to the public to surround the people on foot with the cavalry of defense. A boy named Rovan Yavlyov, ten, 12 years old, protested alongside the crowd. Stationed in the tech area, Roman helped protesters access the internet, charge their phones, and contact their families. As the demonstration continued, numbers continue to grow in support of the pro protest. Religious heads join on stage alongside men of no religion at all, representing the union of organized religion and the public, public state, all for the sake of their nation and their futures. Every hour, protesters break into the national anthem between chanting, Glory to Ukraine! Glory to the heroes! You report that on... January 16th, day 57 of the demonstrations, that the government legalized dictatorship. And signs are put up all over Medan spelling out the consequences of breaking these implemented laws. What were they, and how did they affect the effort of these protesters? Some of these laws included no acts of protest against government, vocal or otherwise, internet, internet access will not be permitted, you are not permitted to wear body armor, helmets, etc., and you cannot, can travel, you cannot travel with more than four vehicles at a time, not for weddings, no exceptions. The man in charge of bringing announcements to the people of Ukraine from the parliament buildings, political spo spokesman Vitaly Kovaletsky, attempts to address the new laws, but the audience, the audience chants overtake him and he is removed from the stage. The police and the Burkut approach the rally and violence ensues. The protesters, now trained in defense and armed with only rocks, sticks, handmade wooden shields, shields, and Molotov cocktails, lock hand in hand. Their fortified barriers are incapable of withstanding the strength of the military tanks sent by Yanukovych, but still the protesters do not give up. They stood tighter together as more efficiently armed officers pushed against them in full body armor. The pr protesters could only hold the officers off for so long before they merged into the crowd. They began shooting the protesters with ru rubber bullets, beating and kidnapping victims. Among the chaos, people of faith are seen kneeling and praying, clutching their rosary beads. Though they were terrified, the demonstrators never gave up. By the 61st day, the police and civilization were in full hand-to-hand -hand combat. combat. Officers strip a male protester, kicking him around in front of the crowd nude, humiliating him. There was no mercy left. 
Police in Burkut destroy makeshift ho hospitals and steal medical supplies. They had begun using live ammunition. People are dropping dead left and right. Police knowingly shoot Red Cross volunteers after revealing their IDs. They attack and arrest all called car dealership activists, ordering destruction of all vehicles. Vitaly Kovaletsky returns to the stage, announcing the government's promise of no more violence, but the people are in, in complete disbelief. With all of these lives lost, protesters feel as if they are at a point of no return. They must fight until the end. By day 82, February 10th, 2014, things had still not influenced the government's position. What is the mood of the people? Though it's below freezing, the protesters remain, standing their ground, feeding each other, and supplying comfort to one another. A young woman plays the piano in the snow while the protesters await the next attack. The music calms the crowd, clapping and cheering as the girl concludes her piece. On February 18th, the 90th day of the protests, the activists agree to conclude their demonstration, but they have a few demands. President Viktor Yanukovych must resign. The kidnapped political prisoners must be released. Equality of power must be established between Parliament, the people, and the President. And finally, there must be an early presidential election. This final protest began just outside the Parliament buildings, and another riot begins. Police, Berkut, and hired criminals initiate this attack. Once again, people are beaten and shot dead. As black smoke begins to rise... In the distance, protesters head for it while the officers take occupancy on high ground. They snipe to kill. Twelve-year-old Roman Yavlyov stands among the men on the front line, using a slingshot to shoot rocks toward the officers. Police begin throwing live grenades into the crowd, surrounded by a barrier of flames. The protesters respond quickly, throwing tires into the fire, forcing thick black smoke into the sky, obscuring the op officers' vision and choking them out of range. Protesters return to Maidan and Independent Squares the police in Berkut recuperate. The streets are filled with rubble and destruction, fire and smoke. Live bullet shells lay all over the ground, along with blood and dead bodies. The officers locate the protesters and approach, but no one runs. The protesters are prepared to fight to the death. Twenty more people are killed, and four hundred more are injured. Protesters have to break into the trade house union, or the trade union house, and use it for another makeshift hospital. Volunteers working medical refer to this as a mass murder. As if this wasn't enough, officers light the building on fire. They bomb it until it's completely destroyed. Meanwhile, victims and able-bodied volunteers attempt to escape. Many people died in the collapse of the trade union house. The next day, 30 more protesters are confirmed dead. Surviving activists return to Mikhailevsky's monastery and assemble another hospital, a new, su new support stations providing food to the large crowd. Families and individuals from all different parts of the Ukraine drive hundreds of miles to Maidan with medicines, food, and other supplies, joining the rally as well. A woman working as a nurse in the monastery recalls the wor worst part of the job being deciding when someone was dead. More and more injured are brought in while you're working on one patient. A bullet wound is a life-threatening wound, and while you're res resuscitating one person, you have to make the decision to stop and move on to that other person. That's what I still hate myself for, having to decide when someone's life was already over. On day 992, February 20th, 2014, you report that this was one of the most violent confrontations yet. Can you describe the final battle before the 93rd and final day of these protests? Well, as you can imagine, the violence, the shootings, and the death continues. Roman Yavlyov fights his way back to the front line after being expelled from the rally due to his young age, but he does not give up. He is de determined to fight for his future. While attempting to pull an injured friend onto a stretcher and get him to safety, a young hero is shot and killed by a sniper. The streets run red with blood, and the wounded are piling up. Many of the injured perish in the streets awaiting care. Red Cross volunteers, overworked, traumatized, and overwhelmed with emotion, quickly pray and continue to fight a losing battle. A 16-year-old is taped calling his mother on his cell phone, while a man is killed on camera only feet behind him. While bullets can be heard flying through the air, the boy calmly comforts his mother, tells her he loves her, and hangs up. The people are broken, but their commitment and determination remains unwavered. The day's battle subsides, and spokesman Vitaly Kovaletsky announces upcoming December elections. Heated, hurt, and determined to conquer, the protesters demand President Viktor Yanukovych resigns by 10 o'clock a.m. the following morning, or their rally will continue. And did he resign? Early the next morning, <clears throat> Viktor Yanukovych was caught fleeing Kiev by flight. 
On day 93, February 21st, 2014, the same day, the Prime Minister of Ukraine, Mykola Azarov, announced Yanukovych's or un unorthodox resignation and an early presidential election will be held on May 25th, 2014, and the Ukrainian government finally si signed the EU agreement. The protesters had won. The people rejoiced and the celebration began. Muslim, Christian, and Jewish, Jewish leaders stood together in harmony. The Euromadan revolution proved victorious. People danced in the streets, cleaning up the rubble and chanting, Glory to the people! Glory to Ukraine! Is this how Winter on Fire concludes? Is there any information regarding the outcome of this revolution? Yes. The total death count of the Euromadan revolution totaled 125 people killed, 1,890 injured, and 65 protesters are still missing. As Russian President Vladimir Putin granted asylum for Yanukovych in his country, Viktor Yanukovych has never been held accountable for his actions. On top of that, the signing of the EU agreement sparked only sparked Russian aggression. Pro-Russian communist violent demonstrations expanded, to east, expanded into eastern Ukraine and once again into Maidan, escalating into another violent war. As of spring 2015, over 6,000 people have been killed in the conflict. After everything these people have endured, what do you think the state of Ukraine's government is today? Unfortunately, very little has changed. The revolution in its, in its success was quickly met by Russian aggression, as I said, and many of the promises of the revolution remain unfulfilled. The dangers of Russian interference have only become clearer. Ukraine's government has still not defeated corruption. As they struggle to become more European, the West is also changing. Europe is, increasing, Europe is increasingly willing to forget the sins of the dictators, offering sympathy to the anti-Europeanism regions in Moscow. The killers of the revolution fled to Russia and walked free. Not only this, but they have joined the slaughter in Syria, where they had previously supp supplied weapons. The main fear is that the West has forgotten to, the, forgotten to achieve their values and the lessons that came with the Euromedan. Have they abandoned their mission that the Ukrainian activists and their com compatriots paid for with their blood, with their lives? It seems that the pro-democratic Ukrainian community will forever struggle to achieve and maintain, maintain the freedom of corruption they seek for. Yet they continue to, to unite for their values, no matter the consequence, voicing the nation's demands, fighting against the government, and popularizing Ukraine's values. Wow, <coughs> that's terrible and disheartening. Well, thank you so much for coming here to speak with us today. We truly appreciate it. Thanks again for inviting me. And until next time, this is Comfort Zone. Thank you for listening.